my name is Paul Jungworth. Uh, I wanted to thank you for coming out to Phoenix RV. Uh, I'm going to be speaking tonight on Rails and SQL or SQL. Uh, I usually say SQL. Um, I do software development here in Portland. Um, I, um, I'm a freelancer. I do software development consulting mostly in uh, Rails, Postgres, and some Chef. Um, and uh, I'm hoping to kind of. Okay. Hoping to give a talk that sort of covers the gamut from kind of beginner to advanced. So hopefully there will be something in here interesting for everybody. Um, hopefully it won't be too boring. Um, uh, and I'll be talking a lot about SQL and some of the more interesting things that you can do with it. Uh, my examples are in a, a context of Postgres SQL. But a lot of this will apply to MySQL or other databases also. So hopefully there will be stuff you can take away from it, even if that's not your normal database that you're working in. And um, not just talking about writing straight SQL, but how you can take that and use it inside of a Rails application. Uh, so one of, the, one of the things that I kind of believe in is that um, if your ORM is good enough, it can support kind of arbitrarily complex SQL queries. So sometimes you hear this debate of people who want to handcraft their SQL and people who want to use an ORM. And I kind of believe that you can have your cake and eat it too. And that's sort of what this talk is trying to argue for, kind of un under the, the between the lines. Um, uh, so I'm uh, just curious to sort of know like where you guys are coming from. Can I have a, a show of hands of like who here knows what the difference is between an inner join and an outer join? So maybe half people. How many of you know the difference between like a, a right and a left join? And how many of you know the difference between like where and having? Okay, so you guys, there will hopefully be good stuff for you in like the middle to the end. Um, but I'm going to cover some of that um, kind of beginner stuff also early in the talk, just to make sure that everyone can kind of follow along. Um, so I'm going to use for most of my examples this schema about restaurant inspections. <coughs> And the idea here is that you have a bunch of restaurants in your database. Each of the restaurants can have zero or more inspections, which happen at a date. Can you zoom in just a little bit? Thank you. Does that help? Yes. And each inspection can have zero or more violations. Um, here's some kind of example data that you can see, uh, where we have a box binder. We're joining all the tables together here. Uh, we have box binder. It's, got, it's been inspected at um, three different dates, it's gotten scores, it's been um, had some violations. Joe's Palace here is a new restaurant, it's never been inspected before, so there's nothing there. And this Crystal Palace has a perfect inspection, no, it has no violations. Um, this comes off of the, the mailing list, and I wanted to thank Rob Schechter for letting me um, use this schema, because his kind of question about how to use these tables was sort of the inspiration for this talk. Um, so, easy stuff, this is just sort of a basic SQL query, um, hopefully all of you have seen this before. It's got uh, a select where we name some columns, it's got a from where we name a table, we're saying give me all of the names and IDs from the inspections table. It's got a where statement where we can filter out some of the rows that we don't want, and we can also give it an order if we want to. Um, uh, now, you can also run SQL uh, in a grouping way, where we give it a group by clause, and um, that lets us transform our output so that we're rolling up the rows according to some uh, criteria, in this case, uh, by the month, right? So here, we, what we're looking for is the, um, the top, scoring, uh, top scoring score for each month of the year, right? Uh, we also have this having clause, and having is kind of like a where clause, except it happens after the after the grouping um, happens. Where happens before the grouping, having happens after the grouping. So what we're saying here is that if nobody has gotten a score of at least 90, just we're not going to give out a prize that month, right? You have to have, that's kind of the, the bare minimum. Um, 
So that's sort of uh, easy stuff in the SQL world, and here is how some of that might translate into the world of active record, right? Um, we're saying uh, that we're, we're looking for inspections with the score of at least 80. We want to give them in, in order. Uh, here, if we have a single inspection, we can traverse this relationship and look for violations that belong to that inspection and see if that restaurant has any racks in it. Uh, one kind of useful trick if you are building queries in Active Record and you're just sort of learning and you're trying to figure out what is Active Record thinking, you can call this to SQL function and it will show you the SQL that it's producing. And that, that's super useful if you are trying to learn the framework or even if you just are getting weird results because you can take that and use that to kind of diagnose what's going on. Yes? You wouldn't need to do that to the console, just the console you would or best content, you would see the SQL, the SQL queries right away. But where would you do that? Put that inspection violation? Yeah. Would you, I mean, you would you put that in the controller? Yeah, well, you could do it wherever you want. You could do it at the console. Um, you could do it in a test. And you could do it, if you were doing it in your actual application code, you'd probably be putting it to your log file instead of uh, the inputs, right? Uh, just like, uh, logger debug or something like that, you know, rails.logger debug if you're not in a place where it's accessible. Um, I mean, you can, put it, you can put it anywhere that you want to, whatever is most convenient. Uh, it's, it just, it's just a string. It just gives you a string, so you can uh, do whatever you want. Um, here's a bit more um, with the where method. Um, you can give it a hash. It asks for everything that does for 90. You can give it a string and find out everything above 90, and you can have these um, parameters with question marks, right? Um, and Rails will handle the escaping for you. Uh, you can qualify things with the table. Rails, unlike a lot of other ORMs that are out there, Rails doesn't uh, like mangle your, your table names or give them strange aliases or anything. So you can always just um, qualify it with the table name you expect. Uh, if you need to, like if you're joining two tables or whatever. Uh, uh, here I have some examples of escaping, and this last one is an example of what not to do, right? If you are interpolating a string into your expression here, then that's not going to be uh, escape for SQL, and you're letting people write, you're letting people submit SQL that you're going to execute, and that would probably cause a lot of bad problems in your application. Uh, so that, that's an example for what you want to avoid. Uh, so I wanted to talk a little bit about inner joins and outer joins. SQL lets you combine two tables together, and this is it's called a join. The kind of default join is like an inner join. Um, and the way you say this is you join uh, this other table, and then you have a on clause for how to join these two things together, right? If you omit the on clause, then you're saying like join everything with everything, and you get a, a mess. Uh, but so you want to like line things up based on your their foreign key. Uh, in inner joins, you're going to throw away anything that doesn't match, right? So if there is a restaurant with no inspection, like the Joe's Place restaurant, it won't appear in the results at all here because it's going to get thrown out. Uh, an outer join will uh, construct sort of imaginary rows with nothing but null. Uh, for anything that's unmatched. So here you would get Joe's place, uh, but um, it would just have you know, null for all of the inspe inspection fields. Uh, that's an inner join and a left outer join. Um, one way to think about this is uh, Venn diagrams. I don't have any pictures in my talk. I apologize for that. But I was thinking on the way over here, um, I could draw on this wall, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so in an inner join, you get this, right? Uh, if this were a left outer join, you would get this. A and B. Um, I'm not sure if that is a very uh, 
rigorous way of thinking about it, but it's probably, hopefully, good enough. And um, from that, you could probably guess what a right outer joint or a left outer joint do, or, or a full outer joint. Um, you, know, you could probably imagine what those might look like. Um, uh, but I don't, I don't, I don't want to talk about right outer joints and full outer joints. If you, if you're a beginner, then these two are basically sufficient for like 99% of what you'll need. Um, so that's really all that you have to, uh, to learn. Um, Oh, the other thing that I wanted to say here, also, I feel like this is a beginner thing, but also something that I've struggled with for a long time, is when you are trying to construct a SQL query, like where do you start? You know, um, I think that you know, it's a declarative language, not an imperative language, and so oftentimes I think people just sort of try something out and try something out, and eventually wander around and find their way to a working query. But um, the, uh, the method that I've kind of picked up over the years is I always start with the from clause. I always ask myself, like, what, what does each row of the output represent? You know, is it a restaurant? Is it an inspection? Is it a month? Uh, what, what's each row of the output? And that immediately tells you what your from clause should be. And kind of from there, you can just hang everything else onto it. You can write the select pretty easily because you know like, what you want. Um, so that's just a tip to, to throw out there that hopefully will be useful for people. Um, and this, uh, I'll go quickly through here. So in, in the, uh, the on has a condition, right? You're comparing where things are equal, and the where has a condition, and um, they're kind of similar. For an inner join, it doesn't really matter where you put these conditions, right? If it's in the on or if it's in the where, you can see these, this is the same query except I've taken this last clause and I've made it into a where clause here, right? It doesn't really matter. Everything is going to be filtered out uh, based on those conditions. But in an outer joint, it actually matters, right? And the way to think about this is that uh, the database will join your tables, it'll add null rows if necessary, and then it'll apply the where condition. So if you have things um, in your on, in your joining condition, it might not filter out as many things as if you put it uh, down here, right? Here, uh, we will we'll still see all the restaurants, even if they don't have a high enough inspection. It'll, it'll just be all empty for its inspection, right? But down here, we're actually saying at the end, we'll throw out all the restaurants um, you know, throughout all the results where the score is more than 80. So it's a little a little subtlety that I think creeps into a lot of programs as minor errors. Uh, so just something to be aware of there. Um, another thing to be aware of is if you're grouping, is beware of having too many outer joins. I think too many joins in general, really. But um, make sure that if you're, say, averaging over something, that you're not actually like including it more than once, right? Because of this uh, behavior of uh, joining. Uh, okay, so now we get to like how do you actually do this in Active Record? And Active Record fortunately has a joins method, and uh, we can use it here to join inspections, um, and it will use the belongs to and has many declarations that you've set up to do that. Um, so it makes it pretty easy. Uh, by default, this will be a, 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 an inner joint, right? And uh, this is useful for avoiding this n plus one problem, which is where suppose you query for all of the restaurants, and then you're going to iterate over them, and you're going to query again for uh, like the first inspection, the score of the first inspection, or something. And this is called n plus one, right? Because you do one query up front for the restaurants, and you do a whole bunch of queries for all of the inspections. So it's inefficient, it creates uh, slow code, and if you are running New Relic, then it will uh, yell at you and complain if you do that. Um, uh, Real also has this includes method, and people, I think, often get them mixed up. People wonder, like, when should I use join? When should I use includes, right? Because they're kind of the same thing. Um, includes, conceptually, is more like an outer join. Right? You'll get all the restaurants, but then it's also going to go and like, prefetch the inspections for you. Um, includes may 
actually be implemented as a left outer join or it may not. And um, if anyone knows how Rails decides, I would be curious to learn that. Um, <laughs> because um, it might just get all the restaurants and then you know, get all their IDs together and then go make another fetch to get all of the inspections for all of those IDs. If you're like, watching the log and the SQL queries that are actually happening, you will probably see that. Um, so you have to be careful uh, with something like this where you assume that that other table has been joined into your query because it may not have been. Um, it may be actually being implemented as two separate queries. Um, but either way, it solves the n plus one problem. Okay, now this is kind of cool. You can add extra columns with this select method. And um, here I'm counting the violations for each restaurant, right? And these will be magically added as attributes to your instances. So later I can say the rest r dot violations count, and it will um, have this number there, um, which is kind of nice. Um, but on the other hand, when I look at this, I start to wonder, like, why are we even using active record? Because it starts to look a little bit messy, right? You've got this SQL that is all broken up. Like, there's a little here, a little there, a little here, some here. Um, and so, um, at this point, I feel like it, it's worth asking yourself why even stick with active record. And I think there are some nice advantages. You know, um, it lets you still use instance methods that you may have defined on your classes. You can you know, use other gems that are built around active record, like Paginate or something. Um, and you can also use scopes, which are one of my favorite features in active record, because it lets they let you define uh, snippets of SQL code that are easily easy to compose. So you can put things together and make queries, and it lets you um, factor out that uh, piece of SQL, keep it in one place, but use it all throughout your code base. Um, another thing I wanted to show here was this little trick called the here doc. And this comes from uh, the shell and from Perl. And it's just a way of quoting multiple lines. And when I'm writing SQL code, I use, the, I use it everywhere because I feel like it really helps to make things readable, helps to make your lines um, short. So that's just a good kind of um, I wanted to talk first about a couple of escape hatches that Active Record offers you. It's always kind of good to have sort of the confidence that you have a way out of your ORM, I think. And one nice one is find by SQL which lets you pass a big string and will give you active record instances. So you still can take advantage of them um, you know, with their methods and everything else, um, but you can write this arbitrary SQL to produce them. And I didn't actually know this until I wrote this talk, but um, you can include uh, uh, parameters in, in here. For some reason, I don't know why, you can only include parameters if you pass it a list. Um, but that, that um, that seems to be how it behaves. Uh, but I think it's nice that you still um, and let Rails do the escaping for you there. Um, even more than escape hatch, you can uh, use these methods. Select rows, select all. Um, these will give you, you know, a, an array of arrays or an array of hashes. Um, there's like a few more uh, that you can choose from. Um, I don't want to just catalog the API here, but I thought it would be worth just noting that these exist. Um, one uh, gotcha is that everything is going to be a string. It's not going to do any kind of type uh, awareness for you, like uh, integers or gates. You're just going to get a bunch of strings, and so you have to deal with that. Um, now, if you are going to use something like that, though, then you don't get uh, those question mark parameters. So Rails won't do the escaping for you. So you have to do that yourself. And um, fortunately, there is this method called quote string. I don't think that very many people know about this. If I look on Stack Overflow, there are all these questions like, how do I escape uh, strings for in, uh, SQL and Ruby? And the answers are all wrong or more harder than they need to be. So if you want like some extra Stack Overflow credit, you should go answer some of the questions. 
Um, <laughs> this method does actually exist, quote string. Uh, so you should use it when you have to. Uh, also, uh, to integer is useful. If you call one dot to integer dot to integer, it doesn't matter. You can call to integer on an integer, and it won't cause you any problems. Um, so I tend to um, be conservative and just call it. Uh, my, my own personal philosophy is that if you have a, a method, you should be able to know that your query is safe just by reading the method body. It doesn't matter like what the rest of your code base is doing. That, that, that's kind of my approach. Um, so I mentioned scopes before. This is an example of defining a couple of scopes. Uh, you can make it kind of static, where it's always the same thing. Here, you know, we'll just say um, restaurants have to score 80. Or you can make it dynamic, where it takes parameters, and here we're capturing a lambda. This first example is actually obsolete. I think that in more recent versions of Rails, it'll complain to you and tell you that it has to be wrapped in a lambda all the time. Uh, but scopes are great, I think, because you can uh, construct them and then use them over and over again. So it helps to dry up your code. <coughs> Okay, here's something that SQL calls a correlated subquery. And this kind of scares people off the first time they see it, I think. Um, but this is a subquery where um, it's reaching out to the outer query for some of its information, right? We're going out to get the ID of the restaurant. And uh, this might not be how the optimizer implements it, but conceptually, this is going to happen for each row. Right? Each row um, in the reference table is going to run this query. Um, this is really useful in combination with something like exists or not exists. And most of the time, it's actually faster uh, than using in or not in. Um, in fact, in some cases, uh, this can produce unexpected results because of no values. Uh, but the reason that I really like this is that it's less constraining than a join. Um, it doesn't alter the shape of your query, right? Here we're still, we've still only got one table here on the outside, we're just uh, uh, using a uh, restaurant. So we're not, uh, we don't have to worry about left joins, inner joins, or you know, extra columns, which might, um, which might limit us if we want to do other things, like grouping, for instance. Uh, I think that subqueries and scopes play really nicely together, because it's so easy to pull this out um, and stick it into this scope, and now you can use it uh, you know, anywhere that you want to talk about restaurants that don't have inspections. Uh, you can also mer uh, merge things. Here I uh, am showing you how you could merge uh, scopes. So we're getting uh, restaurants, uh, but we're actually using this scope to find our inspection. Uh, so this is an interesting thing that you can do um, that is often useful. I kind of feel like uh, uh, sometimes I'm not sure which to choose, whether to uh, do a join and use this merge, or to uh, take this other approach here. I think that they, um, they both are flexible in kind of a different way. So you have to think about which way you want to go there. Uh, Now, uh, one of my kind of favorite examples um, in uh, doing aggregate queries and reporting is if you wanted to get something uh, like a number for each month, if you wanted to know how many inspections happened in each month of 2015, um, you might write a query like this, right? Uh, this is kind of a classic example of grouping by something. So we'll group by each month, we'll count up the number of inspections, uh, and we'll get our answer, right? Except, if you have a month with no inspections, you'll have simply no row in your output, which might be a problem, right? That um, uh, might cause a report to like not really quite, won't quite look right. Um, and Postgres has a really nice solution to this called uh, generate series, which is a function that returns a set. It's called a set returning function. You can think of it as giving you like a whole table here we're getting a whole table named uh, limit S and we'll name the, the column M. Um, that's what this syntax means. 
So we're asking it to give us just a table with a bunch of numbers, 0 to 11. Uh, and we'll use that as our month. Um, and we'll join to inspections uh, and get all of the inspections uh, for each of those months. Uh, if this is kind of noisy and crazy, don't worry about it too much. It's just some data arithmetic to uh, make sure that we're joining the inspections from that month. Uh, but uh, this is kind of a nice trick that I think uh, is useful for avoiding some bugs that uh, you might be having in your reports. Uh, there's something else I wanted to say about generate series. Uh, oh, right. So if you remember a while back, I said that um, my trick to kind of where do you start is to think about what each row of the, out of the output is going to be and use that to write your from clause. And this is a great example of that, right? My report, each row is a month. And so I'll think, oh, OK. Then I'll just start with a list of you know 12 numbers. Uh, so that's kind of an application of that idea. Um, now here's how you might put this into Active Record. Uh, Active Record has this method called from, uh, which is right here. And this actually lets you override the table that it's uh, going to use to pull um, your model's data from, which is kind of crazy to me. Um, if you do that, then obviously your model's data has to come from somewhere. So you're going to have to include a join or something. In this case, we'll have to have a join. So this is just the same query, but it's translated into active record. Um, you could also write this with a right outer join, um, but I said I wasn't going to talk about those. Um, <laughs> Uh, one kind of tricky thing here is you'll notice that I'm selecting, I'm starting from inspection and I've got the condition in here, so the minute just to the one restaurant. So why didn't I just say inspections, right? I mean, you can do that. You can start with the association. Uh, unfortunately, if you do that, then Active Record is going to put this condition in the where clause, and not in the on clause for the join. And so uh, that's going to causing correct results for us. So if you do this trick of overriding the table, uh, you should watch out using it with active record associations, because uh, you might get incorrect results there. Uh, now, there's also something called a common table expression, or a CTE. And this is sort of a way of taking a subquery and lifting it out of your SQL and putting it at the top and giving it a name. Uh, so here, uh, to kind of dry up that previous query, I, I use that to get all of my months uh, uh, and turn them into dates right away instead of fiddling with this list of numbers. Um, you know, get them get it right into a list of dates from the beginning. Uh, then I can use this uh, table here uh, later in my query. Uh, so this is still the same, the same query, just refactored a little bit to so have less repetition. Um, this is uh, mostly a question of aesthetics and of syntactic sugar, but not 100%. Uh, one uh, thing, this is true in Postgres, but not in some other databases have this. This is called an optimization fence. So this will all run kind of independently of the rest of this. And the optimizer isn't allowed to like mix them together and do, do, like, do like smart things to make them faster. So using a CTE might have performance implications. Um, they might actually be positive if you're like calling functions here or something, but um, they might be negative also. Uh, this is great if you need to like insert a bunch of rows and immediately put them, put their IDs into foreign keys somewhere. Um, there's all kinds of applications for this once you are sort of used to using it. Uh, one of the really special applications is if you um, included the recursive keyword here, then you can actually write something to produce like a tree-like structure, which is famously hard to do in SQL. I'm not going to go into the details of that because it could probably be a whole another talk. But uh, if you if you need to produce tree-like structures in your in your SQL, this is a great place to look. Um, so how do you put this into Rails, right? Like, what are you going to use to have this uh, with clause? Unfortunately, Rails doesn't really have a built-in uh, call for that. There is a gem that provides provides it called the Postgres X gem, 
and it gives you this width method that would let you do something like this. Okay, so now I'm at the sort of question that started this talk, which is if you wanted, if you wanted to run a report that listed all of the restaurants along with uh, the score of the most recent inspection, how would you do that? It sounds like the kind of thing that you might use grouping to do, right? Um, but that winds up having more, having, having certain difficulties because uh, you want to, uh, to count the row based on, based on the date, but you want to show the score. So this um, kind of desire to be in two places at one time causes problems with grouping. Here is uh, one way that you could do it with grouping. Um, first, we have to define our own function. <laughs> um, Postgres, unfortunately, doesn't have a, a function called first, but we can create one. Um, there's actually an implementation on the wiki, and the implementation is kind of as simple as it can be. It just returns the first thing. Um, this is kind of like a fold, if you're familiar with that term, or in, in Ruby, uh, collect or inject, right? It's um, going to go through all of the all of the things that are being grouped together and run this thing for you. And um, the first parameter is your accumulator, and the second parameter is the value for the current record. So we're just going to keep returning the first one, right? Uh, so pretty simple. Here we declare it. Um, knowing the kind of syntax of this isn't really important. Um, although I do show it as a Rails migration here. It's pretty easy to use the migration structure to manage these kinds of things. If you're not doing anything really crazy, um, if, you're not, if you're not making a lot of stored procedures, I think that it's nice to use the migration framework to manage them. Um, and here we are using it. Uh, one thing that I think is not often known is that inside of any aggregate function, you can actually specify ordering. Um, so here we'll say the first inspection when, when it's ordered by uh, the date of the inspection. So uh, that's one solution um, to this problem that uh, we didn't talk about on the mailing list. Um, I'm not sure about the performance of this. Um, one thing that I did uh, look at the performance of and got really good results was with something called a lateral join. And this is pretty new. Uh, I think in Postgres, we need to be on 9.4 to have this. Uh, if you put this keyword into your SQL after the join, uh, you can use this with an inner join or a left join, wherever you want. But you put this keyword in here, and um, Sort of like with correlated subqueries, this will be run once for each of the records that you're going over. Uh, uh, here, um, we're going to select all of the inspections, order it by date, and we'll take just one of them. Um, so that gives us um, this join that we need. Uh, part of the join syntax is this on clause. And you sort of have to have it, but we've already done our addition inside of the query here, right? So we don't need to repeat it because we're already only getting one row for each restaurant. So would this say true basically is a formality. If you leave it out, you get a syntax error, um, but it's not really necessary then, right? Uh, so this is actually quite a, quite a fast solution. Uh, and the other thing that I like about it is it doesn't, kind of like the non-exists that I showed before, it doesn't uh, change the structure of your query. It doesn't change like the cardinality. So it, it lets you stay flexible. Um, and we could use this inside of a, a grouping query uh, where we're like counting the number of violations or something like that. Uh, and here we are at Rails. Um, the nice thing, I think, is that there's like nothing, there's nothing new here. Like we have a custom select, we have a join, um, and there's nothing really complicated. Unlike with that CTE where we had to pull in a whole new gem just to be able to support it. Um, so I think I'm kind of running out of time. 
but I wanted to just put on your radar these things called window functions. Um, and if you don't know about them, they, um, it'd be a great thing to, to read and learn about. Um, they are a lot like uh, aggregate functions, but instead of operating on um, the, the rows that you're rolling up because of your group by expression, um, they can group things however they want, kind of independently of the outer barrier. So again, this is something that you can use without uh, without restructuring the main barrier. Um, essentially, they take as input all of the rows that the barrier is going to return, but then you can use this partition by to define your own grouping by on them. So uh, here we're looking at all of the inspections for all of the restaurants, and say we want to know um, you know, how the inspection score compares with the restaurant's like historical average. We can see like when it did better and when it did worse. Uh, this is a good example for when you might use a window function. And average is a pretty boring example of these actually. And there's pretty interesting ones out there. Like you can get the rank, you can get you know the percentile, like this is in the top or bottom, top quartile, that kind of thing. Um, so I encourage you to read more about that. I can't really go into the details on those. Um, uh, here it is uh, factored up into uh, CTE. Although this might have, kind of what I was saying before, this might have negative performance um, because you're pulling out the whole inspection table here. Even if you're doing filtering later, you're going to pull out the whole thing up here uh, because of that optimization trace idea. Uh, so. Writing this talk, I felt like I, there was so much that I could throw in, and this is some of the stuff that I left out um, that maybe someone else could give a talk if you're looking for an idea. Um, I would, would love to hear a talk about some of these things. Um, and um, here's where you can go to read more about it if you like. Uh, the Postgres documentation is just phenomenal. Um, it's very accessible, so I encourage you to, to read that. And hopefully this talk gives you some ideas of how you might access some of those features from the context of your Rails application. Um, thank you for your attention. Uh, are there any questions? I have one real quick. Uh -huh. Do you have any really quick, fast tips about um, creating a query on a polymorphic relationships where you need to gather a lot of information on a bunch of different models? On polymorphic relationships. You mean like real style of polymorphic relationships? Yeah. I don't know, that's pretty tricky because you're going to different tables. Um, I don't have any like anything off the top of my head, sorry. <laughs> that, that, that would be a fantastic talk though. If you are looking for a talk idea, that would be a good talk. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I recently had to do one where I had, uh, you were saying like avoiding a lot of inner, uh, a lot of joins, uh -huh. and that's what I ended up with, like, you know, start stacking joins and joins and joins and joins to get to gather them together, so I was trying to figure out if there's any better way to do it than that. Yeah, one of the, the key, the common kind of traps, I think, is you have a central table, and you've got like many of these and many of those, and you do a left outer join on here and a left outer join on there. And you can end up with a lot more rows than you expected. And if you are doing like aggregates, like averages, your averages might be wrong because you're including like the same number multiple times or whatever. But yeah, that would be it. I think I think you should do a talk on this. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get on that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, by the way, the code for this is online. Um, there's a sample Rails application with some architect tests just to prove that I wasn't like giving you bad code or whatever. Um, <laughs> uh, so feel free to take a look at that if you want. Uh, thank you.